Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. We're now turning our conversation to today. It's March 1st. Every year today uh, is celebrated as United Nations Day for Zero Discrimination. So Zero Discrimination Day 2021 is dedicated to taking action to end all the inequalities surrounding income, sex, sexual orientation, age, health status, occupation, disability, drug use, gender identity, race, class, ethnicity, and religion that continue to persist around the world. The United Nations says that inequality is growing uh, for more than 70% of the global population, worsening the risk of division and hampering economic and social development. Unfortunately, these inequalities worldwide have been deepened, and that's due to COVID-19 which is hitting the most vulnerable people the hardest. Now, even vaccines against COVID-19 are becoming available. There is a great inequality in accessing them. Uh, the reports then went on to say that uh, many intellectuals have equated this to vaccine appetite or vaccine nationalism. To discuss this, we've invited the executive director, Spaces for Change. Her name is Victoria Ibezi Moheri. Uh, good morning and thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. All right. Now, from an event uh, marked on World AIDS Day in 2014, could you tell us a bit uh, about how the day March 1st has evolved and what it means for the global community? Yes. Um, today is Zero Discrimination Day. And it's a day set aside for ending all forms of discrimination. Um, towards people, whether on the basis of gender, place of origin, sex, sexual or um, uh, orientation, political representation, and um, different forms in access to healthcare, in access to education, in access to um, natural resources. So it symbolizes equality. That the time is a clear is a clear and call on world leaders to promote equality in every aspect of human endeavor. Okay, um, I'm, I'm always going to bring it down here to Nigeria because that's where it's uh, most important for us and our viewers. Um, let's talk about the things that have made it difficult to uh, fight um, discrimination for us to be able to achieve in any way or move steps closer towards zero discrimination. Um, the peculiarities of our situation here in Nigeria, what has made it harder? So many things made it, um, so many, there are so many barriers to achieving um, full um, equality. Um, the first and foremost is that the constitution recognizes importance of non-discrimination. So in chapter, in section 42 of the Nigerian constitution, which is, which falls under the um, fundamental human rights, there is an express prohibition against all forms of discrimination. And um, by that constitutional provision, it says basically that no Nigerian citizen, whether by, um, is that an every, sorry, let me, I just wanted to read them from the constitution, no Nigerian citizen shall be by the place of, um, of any particular community, any group, place of origin, sex, religion, political opinion, shall not by reason that he's such a person be subjected either expressly or on the practical application of any force in law, any executive and administration action of the government, to disabilities or restrictions to which citizens of Nigeria or other communities, ethnic groups, places of origin, sex, religion, political opinions, are not made subject of. And the, that is the, the root cause of all forms of discrimination we see in the country. And what are those forms of discrimination we are seeing in the country? First, we look at um, inequality in gender representation. You would see from um, the House of Representatives to the um, Senate, the number of women you see in the green and the red chambers. Then also in the number of political appointees, you would see just about six women out of hundreds of people, you know, in occupying very senior political offices. And that again is a gap. That again is inconsistent with the prohibitions in section 42 of the constitution. Then we also see inequality in regional representation where you see the national security portfolios in the country. You see the gap where 
region and religion has become the primary indicator for appointment of people in those high political offices. Again, we also see discrimination in um, access to education. We all know about the um, cut of point, cut of mark um, controversy where students from a particular state we need to score as high as 138 to get into the unity school. Whereas in other states, you ought to have to put students that sat for the exact same examination have to score as little as two to be admitted into the same schools. That again is one of the most brazen forms of inequality we see in the country. Then we bring it down also in access to healthcare. With COVID-19 has exposed the underbelly of the inefficiencies within our healthcare system. Uh, what have we seen? We have seen the elitization of disease. Um, with the gas and oxygen scarcity, with the bed space scarcity, with the millions of naira people are required to cough out just to get a bed space. Obviously, the door, the gap has widened and in access to healthcare, making it impossible for people within a certain income group to access healthcare, especially if they um, contact the coronavirus. Right. Okay, so um, let's talk about some of these different areas as outlined by the UN. Uh, you just touched a bit on gender and education. So um, focusing on the bias in terms of social status, how bad is the problem here in Nigeria? In terms of the... Social status, bias, discrimination on the basis of social status. Bias. Can you hear me? Yes, you said buyer. No, I'm saying let's talk about discrimination on the basis of social status and how bad the problem is here in Nigeria. It's, it's, I, I think it's manifest in almost everything, even in the way we distribute social and economic resources and opportunities. Um, we can see the examples um, like in Lagos State, where a spaces for change we've been advocating um, for even distribution of infrastructure. And we see infrastructural inequities uh, in the way our resources or infrastructure resources are located to places where the rich live and where the poor people live. Where the poor people live, they are often targeted by forced evictions. Um, if there is for flooding in downtown communities like um, Badia in Ilobirin or in places like Makoko, the official response to those localities would be let's move them away. They are blocking drainages, they are constituting a nuisance to um, the society. So, demolition is almost always the response, official response to people that live in those downtown communities. But if that same problem manifests in a choice neighborhood, maybe within the Ikoi or Victoria Island corridor, then the government will start thinking of bringing experts together, start thinking of very ingenious ways of mitigating the problem without causing pain to the people that live in that neighborhood. So that is an example of how decisions are made in ways that perpetuate inequalities between people of different social classes started talking about it and that is the COVID-19 aspect. Um, in the news this morning we are talking about expecting three million plus vaccines uh, very soon. Um, do you you know expect that this same discrimination challenge that we have in our country will affect uh, the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines? How do you also hope that the government will be able to um, distribute vaccines evenly without discrimination? So the, the discrimination, I see them as two tiers. One is at the global level, and one is at the national level. Yes. And one, again, another. there's also another one playing down at the local level. But let's look at the two tiers happening at the global level and at the um, national level. At the global level, the vaccines are mostly coming in from foreign countries. Um, some are selling, some are donating. I know um, China and Russia, they are selling and some donating to some countries. And in the Europe axis, they are much more concentrated in vaccinating their own citizens. And um, 
making sure that their yeah, country is disease-free. And all those things are being done on the premises of nationalism. And much more recently, it was, um, I think, uh, Macron of France that was um, appealing to other world leaders to donate 3 to 5% of their vaccines to Africa to avoid exacerbating inequality. That is a good call. That is a good call, but um, it is also a question of invention. It's also a question of um, nationalism. It's also a question of who do I serve most? Do you, do you protect yourself? You need to protect yourself first before protecting others. So that is what is um, magnifying those inequalities at the global level. But there is also a clearing call on Africa. I think it's also a call on Africa to end the pity party. We cannot always, almost always all the time, depend on the West for survival. Mm. Yeah, but um, but, but uh, I, I wanted I wanted us to you know also look at you know how we will deal with that here in Nigeria because there's also fears that whenever the vaccines come they will go to the rich first they'll go to the politicians first they'll go to people oh, who can course, afford them of course of um, course of course that's going to happen because it's already happening in access to treatment for COVID nineteen so there are some the few isolation centers that you have in the country are populated by people who can afford the high cost of oxygen. There's oxygen scarcity made um, caused by coronavirus. And um, some of the testimonies shared by people who died recently, um, there was a popular uh, billionaire that died recently and the family shared um, is their experiences in one of the isolation centers where they are made to cough out 10 million naira to, for a bed space. Then the question is in a country where minimum wage is 18,000 naira, how many people? Let, oh, 30,000 naira. How, 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 how long do you need to save 10 million naira? And it's a deposit. It's a deposit. Deposit hmm. means there is still additional fees to be paid. So that is a clear indicator that COVID-19 um, is, if you don't have money, your chances of survival are very minimal. And the same thing would happen when we have access to, when we have the vaccines, when they come hmm. in. The rich people, in fact, most of our rich people are seeing pictures on social media. Some of our rich people are already traveling abroad. Yes. There are pictures of one of our politicians and went to Dubai. You know, many of them are already traveling abroad. Then, if they are traveling abroad to get the vaccine and the vaccine has already come down to them, it's already obvious what you know they're going to do. It's right. going to be them, the families, their loved ones. And when they protect those ones, friends, and if there's a leftover, of course. That's when ordinary masses will have a chance. Too yes. sad. But the World Health Organization launched the COVAX to ensure that you know states that are most vulnerable and cannot afford to purchase the vaccines can get access to them. But it's, it's been how many years now, or rather how many months now, since vaccines you know, have been produced? But countries like Nigeria and all, many others in Africa are yet to get access to these vaccines. So really, how much can the COVAX Alliance do to tackle this and ensure that there is zero discrimination regarding vaccines? Yeah, the first thing is that there is the diplomatic commitment, then there is the political will. There has to be a match between the two. Um, I think Ghana is the first country to have the vaccines arrive in their country. And the alliance can make certain commitments and it has to be matched with political will of the people on the ground, people who make decisions on the ground. So if you have a COVID alliance making certain commitments to ensure that the vaccine reaches the most vulnerable and is not matched by seriousness, concrete action, at the local level, some of those commitments, I'm afraid, might not materialize. Mm. And I think that there is best practice to copy from at the beginning, at the initial stages when the vaccine just came out. Um, Western countries started vaccinating that by vaccinating their health workers and people above 17, because they were regarded as most vulnerable to coronavirus infection. And afterwards, they expanded the, the distribution and spread of the vaccine to ordinary citizens and millions of people have been vaccinated. So that is an example of how countries match political will with global commitments to see action happen on the ground. So until that happens, I'm afraid that those commitments might not mean much, especially with the trends we are seeing in the um, 
uneven distribution of access to treatment of All coronavirus. Right. From what you've described, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to drive the message of uh, zero discrimination um, across Nigeria. Um, and most importantly, uh, there's a lot of conversations that need to be had, a lot of campaigns need to be done um, to fix this. Um, but I want to move to another angle that I believe has a huge, uh, you know, uh, challenge here in Nigeria, and that is the discrimination uh, with regards to sexual orientation. Um, how far, you know, apart are we with regards to this? And, you know, is there hope that, you know, we can take a few steps closer towards achieving zero discrimination here? Yeah, Nigeria is still a country powered by um, cultural norms, cultural and religious norms. To a very large extent, um, um, sexual orientation for our cultural norms, our cultural uses, usages is between man and woman. And increasingly, we are seeing a shift from man and woman relationships to same-sex relationships. And that is causing a lot of tension, tension between advocacy and reality. The advocacy is let there be equality regardless of your sexual orientation. The reality is that it's producing a lot of tensions. And the I think we're not producing results because there is a lot of shushuism. What I call by shushu is a lot of hush hush, hushing down of people who are expressing their disapproval with those um, new letter the advocacy. And once you are not allowing people to express the reasons for their discontent, then it's likely produced tension. So there's no conversation going on. We know that it is now politically correct to just say, it doesn't matter, you can be free, you can be, you can, be, you can like it, same sense, you can be straight. There's a lot of advocacy around it, but there's a suppression of the debate about what people want and what people don't want. And as long as you suppress those debates, going to, you're not going to have a lot of um, solutions, a lot of um, enforceable solutions. And I think that suppression needs to cease so that people can have a valid conversation about how to deal with some of those conversations about um, sexual orientation. But at the core of that converse, at the core of this, this discussion is that um, there are lots of cultural inhibitions and um, there are lots of religious inhibitions, there are traditional inhibitions to um, sexual orientation that is any form of sexual orientation that is outside of what um, culture and traditions and religions have prescribed. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Victoria Ibezi Moheri, the Executive Director, Spaces for Change, for coming on The Breakfast to shed more light on this issue and to encourage people to practice zero discrimination, uh, you know, in the world today. Thanks again for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And if we can't... Uh change our laws immediately at least we can start the conversations you know we can we can you know push you know the campaign slowly to en enable us have a totally different narrative with regards to discrimination age sex gender um, social status and and so much and it's also very important you know at a time when the world is dealing with a pandemic that every person um, knows that they have equal rights to um, receive covid 19 vaccines mm -hmm. and covid 19 treatment um, here in nigeria Thanks once again to her. Yes. So thanks to you, Sarge, for being here with me today. Starting up the month <laughs> on, a good note, on a good note. Indeed. Um, it's, it's been a very, very interesting program this morning. Thanks for staying with us. First day in the month of March. We hope that it's going to be um, a smooth ride all through the month. Um, if you missed out on any of these conversations, remember to get on our social media platforms at Plus TV Africa on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel at PLOS TV Africa and find out all the information you may have missed this morning. Yes, thank you once again for being a part of our morning. Have a beautiful day.